he probably read his life story 35 times. I think it's because he doesn't want people to forget what he's been through. And it's just so ironic that as this disease has taken over his life, you know, he's starting to forget his own memories. And so here it starts, and it's talking about him and his life, and then we're a third of the way through the book, and he starts over. And so he writes his name, and he was born on December 1st, 1922, and then it goes through his whole story once again. He told me he was scared. He knew he was starting to lose it, and his memory was starting to go. He, he was vocal to me and said, you know, I need help, and I, I, I need to get out of my apartment, and, and I, I can't live by myself anymore. Dancing is, it's his pleasure. Dancing to music is what Sam, it makes him happy, it makes him tick. He used to be very active. He was always going to the senior centers of the city. He was around people, he was dancing, he was happy, he was loving life. So where Sam is now, he, he can't dance anymore. He hasn't been dancing for the last year. Um, and the hope is, is when he moves into the facility, he'll be able to start dancing again. I'm having a network of people that's happened to the Alzheimer's Foundation. They've introduced me to a group of nurses that have been able to take care of my uncle. You know, for a man that's been able to, you know, beat almost everything else, to know that this is one he ultimately isn't going to be able to beat, it's tough. But there's hope. There's hope for him to find a cure. There's hope to make the rest of his days sounder better. What I think will make his life more enjoyable is, is getting into an assisted living facility where they have the tools and resources to help people in this situation. No matter what hand you're dealt, it's really your attitude and the way that you go through life that's gonna, you know, ultimately decide the way that you live your life. And as long as we keep on fighting, there's hope.
promise I won't do it in obvious and you can make announcements like you have two minutes and 16 seconds left. Shorts. I'm the crossword editor for the New York Times. This puzzle has a special story behind it. Only one person knows all the answers, but she doesn't remember them anymore. Alzheimer's is a devastating disease. We wanted to demonstrate its effects and show how the AFA can help. So we took a common hobby transformed it into a way of experiencing the disease. First, we learned the facts about patients' lives by interviewing their relatives. My grandmother is Catherine. She had forgotten to feed the dog. She found a doll, named it. My dad's name is Richard. My name is Doug. My dad completely uh, burned the fried chicken. Then, we had Will Shorts create puzzles based on each patient's life and the answers they can no longer find. We worked with the biggest newspapers in the United States to have the puzzles covertly published, making enthusiasts struggle to find the simplest answers. In addition to the newspapers, a range of media drove people online, where they could learn more about how the AFA can provide support. We showed the effects of Alzheimer's through a crossword puzzle that not a single person can solve. We reached over 5 million newspaper readers, a total of 50 million adding other media. AFA saw a 159% increase in web traffic and another 62% in calls. And with unsolvable crossword puzzles, we helped many find the answers they needed. Get things 
started, I'd like to introduce Dr. James Lawrence, who is the director of the Cleveland Lingo Center for Brain Health Neurological Institute, and Joseph Common, the endowed chair of the Cleveland Clinic Neurological Institute. Please welcome Dr. Levering. Alzheimer's, what's normal aging, kind of what's going on with the old and some of the research that we're doing uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic. Epidemiology, so frequency, some of these things, um, definitions, what causes dementia, once we define what dementia is, what Alzheimer's disease is, and then talk at the end about sort of therapeutics, both in terms of current, but particularly sort of where the field is going and trying to develop therapies, particularly to treating the disease itself. So um, I would like to throw this at the beginning, because it's good for epidemiology. Um, so the mouse tells Garfield, you shouldn't worry about turning 21, which is obviously old for a cat. Uh, I had an uncle who lived to be 21, he says, really? I remember what he always used to say to me, is that? Who the heck are you? <laughs> so if you don't want to get dementia, don't get old. Um, really, if you look at the, at the data, what you can see is that dementia is very much an age-related Phenomena. You can be a glass half full or a glass half empty person. Uh, by about 90, your chance for dementia is about 50%. So half the people don't have it, but half the people do. Um, and um, beyond 90, the statistics are a little difficult to interpret because there aren't as many people as many things. Some in increasing number. This is really driving the epidemiology. You hear people talking about it doubling of the number of cases of Alzheimer's and dementia. And that's really driven by the fact that age is by far the biggest risk factor for dementia. And it is the 85 plus group, that 50% at risk group, that's growing the most rapidly in our population. So myself along with other baby boomers are starting to get older. And just because there are many more older people, you're gonna see an increase in frequency. We don't think the actual frequency per age is any different. It's not like there's more. I think we diagnose it more frequently, but we also have a lot more people who are at risk because we have an aging population. Um, this is a study that was looking at Parkinson's disease, another age-related disease, but I think makes the point that I want to make, which is it was looking at the number of people who were going to be getting Parkinson's disease based on the aging of societies around the world. Um, in wider places they didn't look at. Um, and the idea was from 20, 2005 when the study came out to 2030, I believe, and then and a, basically a doubling in the number of cases, what we would expect with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, other age-related diseases. What really struck me here was what was going on in Brazil, in India, China, Indonesia, here added up in Wikipedia, this is over half the world's population, where the estimates were there was even more than doubling of age-related neurological disease. So this is no longer a disorder of the United States and Europe, this is a worldwide health issue. And so the predictions and the numbers uh, around the world are doubling and tripling um, and pretty much in all societies. So let's talk a little bit about definitions. Um, how many of you have heard of the term mild cognitive impairment? Fair, fair number. Um, so this is a, a term that we use both clinically but also research-wise to identify people who are struggling with their thinking skills, maybe on a test, like a crossword puzzle, don't do so well, um, but actually are pretty functional in their day-to-day -day life. 
And there's a lot of interest in these people, as I'll talk about at the end, um, in identifying people at the very earliest stages of development of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, with the idea that the earlier you, you treat people, the more likely you're going to be able to stop the disease, slow the progression, or even cure it. Um, much like we think about catching cancer early before it is spread. Um, so the idea was start with this, with pink, you know, really it's been around for about 15, 20 years now, this idea, um, is capturing people at the very earliest stages of disease. Um, the one thing I would mention here is that um, unlike the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, clinically, probably about 20, 25% of people who fit this criteria either convert back to normal or five years later have not converted to any further decline. So it's not an absolute indication that you're going to develop dementia, it's just that you're at a higher risk. Dementia, on the other hand, is a term where we're talking about uh, that change in thinking skill, uh, but now it actually does impact the day-to-day -day function. And of course, that's a little bit of a subjective term. I worked at the VA for many years before I came to Cleveland, and some of my older men were very traditional marriages, 85 years old, as long as they made it to the dinner table and they, they weren't incontinent, they were functional. Um, versus my 55-year-old with early onset Alzheimer's who's trying to run a company. So I may have somebody, for example, who had to retire from their profession, but otherwise is really perfectly functional, they actually fit this diagnosis of dementia. So while despite that sort of stigma of that term, it really doesn't, it, it covers a wide range of people, not just that people who are in a nursing home and requiring to be fed, this is people who are walking around that you see every day, uh, who have lost some sort of function because of their, their memory or other kind of thinking skill changes. Alzheimer's disease is that kind of dementia the most common question I get. Is Alzheimer's dementia, is dementia Alzheimer's? So dementia is the umbrella term. Alzheimer's is one of the major causes of, of dementia, particularly in an older population. Um, so for the diagnosis, people have to be have a dementia. Um, it usually is insidious, although it's not uncommon to have somebody come to me and say, everything was fine until he had that prostate surgery or she went for cardiac surgery. And after they woke up, they didn't seem as, as sharp, and, and they never really seemed to recover, and in fact, seemed to decline after that. So often, a stressor will bring out the symptoms. So you know, we know, for example, that the changes in the brain are there 10 or 20 years before you develop symptoms. So people kind of get close to that edge where they start exhibiting symptoms, you put them under stress, and these symptoms come out. There is some interest that maybe some of these things affect the immune system, and the immune system may accelerate the disease. That's an area of research that, that we're looking at and people around the country are looking at. Most people with Alzheimer's present with what we call an amnestic picture, and that's a memory loss. And the common story is they come in, I ask about memory, the family says, you know, he remembers he sat behind in the first grade, 70, 80 years ago. Uh, I said, what about recent memory? They go, well, he asked us where we were going five times in the car on the way here to see you. So that kind of discrepancy between short-term and long-term memory is particularly characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. What we are finding, uh, sort of unfortunately, but what we need to find anyway, is that some people present in other ways. There are people who present more with a language problem, a so-called language variant, people who struggle with visual-spatial skills, finding their way around, people who struggle with executive skills. Um, so this is the most common, but there are some variants of Alzheimer's, and we're not sure what that means. Are those people different? Are they gonna respond to certain therapies differently? We're just starting to sort of identify these subtypes. I do think this is important, I'll make this point later, but you know, it used to be, right, we treat cancer, and we were looking for that single, right, vaccine or pill that would cure all cancer, then we realized that wasn't gonna work. We had to subdivide cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. Now even breast cancer is subdivided into multiple different types, and that dictates what kind of therapy you're going to get. I think dementia is going to be very much the same. I'll talk about the complexity of actually what goes on in the brain in dementia, besides just Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that's uh, something we're just coming to grips with, much like cancer did 20 years ago. 
So what's normal aging? So I like to think that um, as you get older, there's very few things that get better as you get older, right? Your joints hurt more, that phenomenal way. Um, but actually, the one thing that does get better is you know more stuff, because we've been exposed to more things. And my coordinator here, Jessica, will be tired of this, but and, um, when I meet with my coordinators, who are mostly under the age of 30, and I say, do you know, do you know who Errol Flynn is, or was? They look at me with this blank look. They have no idea. Those of us who are a little bit older, who've seen some older films, who know who Errol Flynn was, an actor, um, in case you didn't know. Um, so you're just exposed to stuff, so you know a lot more. Um, and uh, but the problem is, those file cabinets are very full, and so the main thing that we notice with just normal aging is the speed with which you pull that information out slows down. So when you are at the grocery store, this happens to me, and I see somebody that I should know their name right off the top of my head that doesn't come to me another five minutes or 12 hours later, um, <laughs> That uh, that's normal. Uh, pulling up words, pulling up Errol Flynn's name, those sorts of things. You know, you're trying to come up with that actor's name. Um, that's very normal. And if you get a hint, usually it comes right to you. That means that information's in there. It's just tough getting it out. The problem in Alzheimer's disease is really this problem: it's encoding this new information. So people having trouble remembering the new stuff is the most typical thing. Uh, and that's. That's the big difference between normal aging and um, what we see in Alzheimer's disease. <coughs> so as I mentioned, dementia is a, an umbrella term. Alzheimer's disease is uh, probably the most common, but there are lots of other kinds of dementia. There's Lewy body dementia, there's a dementia called frontotemporal, one associated with Parkinson's, one associated with stroke. But probably even more importantly, what we're increasingly recognizing and I like to say that as we get older, right, it's not just my right knee that hurts, my left foot hurts, there's multiple things go on. That's what's going on in the brain too. This is a study we did in Seattle when I was at the University of Washington, looking at community-based patients with dementia, so that term I used earlier. Um, so what was the underlying cause? Well, in blue is everybody who had Alzheimer's disease. This is an autopsy study. Um, and so you can see a lot of people had Alzheimer's disease, but what I want you to focus on is this is the little slice here, 14% of this whole group had only Alzheimer's disease pathology in their brain. So many more people had co-existent what we call Lewy bodies, co-existent vascular disease, and in fact, essentially, the same number of people had Alzheimer's, Lewy bodies, and vascular disease or stroke as had Alzheimer's alone. So this is increasingly recognized, and this is very important. I talk later about biomarkers. One of the reasons we're gonna to need to know about biomarkers, not only will there be subtypes of Alzheimer's, but we wanna know if we have all three of these things going on, is this person gonna to respond to therapy the same way this person is going to? These are questions that we need, we need to answer. Um, and the only way we can know in terms of what's going on in the brain, this is an autopsy study, this isn't gonna do you any good. Uh, uh, this is exactly. Um, but what we want to do is be able to make this pie chart in real life. And I think we're starting to get towards that. Um, but we're looking at ways that we can look at a person during life, see exactly what's going on in the brain, and personalize the therapy for them. This is just another study from a group at Rush that's been doing a very similar thing to what we did in Seattle, looking at the community based sample. And what they noticed in their dementia group was that over 75% of people that they looked at, this is about 1,000 autopsies that they looked at, over 75% had at least more than two or more co-pathologies accounting for their dementia. And, um, and I think when they looked at the different combinations of pathologies that they could see, um, they saw over 200 combinations within a group of 1,000 individuals. So, it is a lot more complex than, than we would like it to be, um, but that's, that's the reality. So let's get back to what's Alzheimer's disease. So this is Alice Alzheimer's, and he would drive, describe the original case that most of us refer to, a woman named uh, August Fischer, um, German, uh, and she presented in her 50s uh, with a dementia syndrome, 
actually found one of those variants had a lot of language problems. Uh, and he followed her in Joel autopsy and described the changes that he saw in the brain, both in terms of looking at the brain as a whole, that he saw that it had shrunk in some, but also under the microscope, he saw these things we call tangled bundles and fibrils, that we now are called neurofibrillary tangles. And uh, deposition of a peculiar substance, which are the amyloid plaques. So we still use those exact same pathological changes to diagnose Alzheimer's disease now uh, over 100 years later. Um, so very good anatomist, um, saw exactly what he saw. Um, actually for many years, and um, up until the sort of 1970s, people thought Alzheimer's was a very rare form of dementia that only affected people who were young because the original patient was in her 50s. Um, and it wasn't until people started doing autopsy studies and realized changes they see in an 85 year old with dementia look exactly like the changes that they were seeing in these younger onset people that they realized this is all the same disease. So this is, these are the plaques that he described, this amyloid deposition. And so this is what a plaque looks like under the microscope. This is not something that we can see um, easily uh, uh, during life, although I'll show you about how we're starting to try to find that. Um, and in the middle is this protein we call beta amyloid protein, or sometimes we shorten it to BAP. I have a quick joke later, so remember BAP. Um, but this is what we see under the microscope in Alzheimer's disease in terms of the plaques. What we know is that beta amyloid, that BAP here, comes from a protein that we all have, uh, amyloid precursor protein. And we and that gets degraded into two kinds, a soluble form that seems to be non-toxic, and this beta amyloid protein that actually is what deposits in, in the plaques. Uh, this protein, the gene for that, is on chromosome 21, which is kind of relevant. Um, so anybody know what disease is strongly linked to chromosome 21? Down syndrome. Down syndrome. Down syndrome. Right, Down syndrome. So right when you're born, you get one chromosome from your mom and one from your dad. So you have two copies of chromosome 21. And in Down syndrome, they, get, they have three. They usually get, they get two from one parent one from the other, and so they have three copies. And just having three copies of this normal protein, oops, sorry, go back here, normal protein, so just having three copies instead of the normal two copies puts them at 100% risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. There's not a single study that has shown um, somebody who's come to autopsy with Down syndrome who didn't have the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease in their so that was the first clue that this protein, this gene, may be the link to what's causing Alzheimer's disease. Why so much effort has been towards trying to either get rid of this beta amyloid protein or to block the breakdown. Unfortunately, there has been a number of studies recently that have been negative to try to block this enzyme that would produce this beta amyloid protein, the beta secretase or base inhibitor. You may have heard of recently several studies that were stopped early either because of toxic side effects or because it just wasn't, just wasn't working. Still a number of studies, which I'll talk about later, where we're trying to get rid of this beta amyloid protein from the brain. The other major change that Alzheimer described, and these are actually drawings of his, um, are the neurofibrillary tangles. So these are these tangled bundles of fibrils we talked about in the cells. And these are made of a different protein from a different gene called the tau, tau protein. That's on chromosome 19. Uh, mutations and changes in that protein have not been linked to Alzheimer's disease. So we don't think this is the cause of Alzheimer's, but what we know is when those tangles start to appear is when people start to develop dementia, when people start to develop memory issues. So lots of people, actually the estimate is 35 million Americans right now have amyloid protein in their brain. Remember, there was about 5 million people with clinical Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of people walk around amyloid. But once we start to see this tau protein deposited in the brain, then we start to see a change because it's in the cells themselves, evidence the cells aren't working right. So some people have argued that the 
actually, who cares about the amyloid? We can prevent these tau aggregates, these tangles, keep the cells from not working. I don't care if my brain is full of amyloid if I'm still thinking all that. So that kind of leads to a fun joke I have here. Um, so people <laughs> who really believe the amyloid is important, we often call Baptists because we say amyloid protein. People who really think that tau is important, we often call tau. And it is almost like a religious fervor. You, you submit grants and it's around this, and you get a Baptist reading it, they're just going, this is just wrong. Um, and vice versa. It can be really quite uh, interesting. So how do I make a diagnosis? Well, this is really an order of importance. For me, I, the history. The history is 90% of the diagnosis. What is it that the person is, is experiencing? Usually, what is it that the caregiver or, or partner or children are noticing? You saw that in the video that you start to notice things like, they don't show up when they're supposed to because they forgot about the appointment. Um, or they're repeating themselves, or they're losing things, um, that sort of thing. Careful history is very important. Everything else is sort of confirming what we're hearing. Um, so we do a, some sort of memory test, I do a neurologic exam, we do some laboratory testing, and actually most importantly, um, and maybe those of you at the AFA hear this a lot, is people get a diagnosis and the doctor says, well, maybe you should start looking for nursing homes and come back if you need anything. And that's kind of just off, off the edge of the earth, so to speak. The one thing we certainly like to do in our clinic is we always see people on regular follow-up to give them the support they need. Because people need to process, they need to figure out what they do. This is, a, this is an ongoing process. History is very important, but also some of these things do play a role. I had a favorite patient where I was seen and they actually had not Alzheimer's disease, but a kind of frontal dementia where you lose your language, your ability to speak, kind of like you have a stroke. Um, so I saw the patient first, actually, it was clear that he was what we call aphasic, could not really talk at all. And I walked in, I'm thinking, they're going to tell me this history of early language dysfunction. I said, so what's the problem? And, and they said, well, he's, he's got a memory issue. I thought, really, a memory issue? Go, yeah, he's forgotten how to speak. So you really need to be very careful interpret uh, memory, et cetera. So then mentioned in Alzheimer's, memory loss, that short-term memory loss is usually the most common thing. We do tend to see a few more subtle symptoms, executive dysfunction, decision-making. My own mother who had Alzheimer's started sending checks off to a variety of some more nefarious groups. Of course, once we sent one check, they sent back more letters, and they actually were sending things like bills. So it's like a bill that they would send her. So you always wonder who falls for these things. Well, my mother was one of those, and we had to intercept, intercept her mail, because she, she believed she needed to pay these things. Um, so decision-making, um, we often see apathy, interpreted as depression, which is this loss of internal drive to do things. So I'll hear families come to me and say, I think he's depressed because he sits and looks out the window all day and doesn't do much. Um, but, but unlike depression, you get them up, you get them involved in something, we saw that with the video, you get them dancing, doing other things, they can still enjoy themselves, unlike a depressed person who usually loses that ability to enjoy things that they would normally enjoy. And these are treated slightly differently, so that's important to recognize. They do tend to have less insight. So, you know, innumerable patients come in, it's either I came here to see you, right? I'm in the Center for Brain Health, it's on the door, everything else, and they'll come in and I'll ask them why they're there and they'll say, well, you take my bunion. Um, or they'll look to their family member and say, they brought me here. Mm -hmm. um, and these sorts of things. And they often don't recognize that there's a big problem. To be a bit of a problem from a, a management point of view. What kind of bedside testing? The mini mental test is something probably a lot of you have heard about. The key needs a little bit less, partly because those of us who do research in the area, it has been, um, the, the copyright on this has been enforced, and so the clinic would have to pay a large amount of money to the, if we were using it, um, so we've switched to something else. Something I do kind of like is the, called the mini pod. This is a very quick test. You give people three items to remember, have them draw a clock, and then have them come back and remember those three items. Sort of a really quick screening test that the primary care doc can do in basically a minute. Um, so the idea is just something that's a very much a screen. 
clock drawing. There's all sorts of science around clock drawing. I remember uh, many years ago, there was actually a clock drawing meeting uh, where they were looking at how, how it's being interpreted and so forth. And we do see it degrade a little bit over time. Um, this is my favorite clock. <laughs> and I was working with a resident, a trainee, and he came back and said, I think I asked him to draw, to draw a clock face. So, uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, I don't know how I would score this. Um, anyway, so it's a good clock. You will increasingly see doctors use something called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It's free. It comes in something like 35 different languages. You can go online and pick it up. It's mochatest.org here. Um, and it's a little bit more difficult, so people will miss a few points. Um, but it is very sensitive to picking up early, early changes. This is what it looks like. Um, actually, this is the most frustrating part. I, I don't know how many people say that this is a hippopotamus. Um, that a lot do, um, and it's very, it's somewhat cultural. So uh, I've done some work with a group in Peru, and we have people who come from the mountains of Peru, and they look at it, they look at this, and they have no idea what that is because they've never seen a lion or a picture, or anything. So they come up with all sorts of interesting uh, comments. Um, so we do, so I get a history, I do some testing, those are consistent. <coughs> I'll do some blood work just to look for things that may aggravate dementia, if rare disease cause dementia. Um, I generally don't do genetic testing unless there's a strong family history. I'll talk a little bit about spinal fluid in a minute, and we usually try to do some sort of structural imaging, uh, CT scan, MRI. We can actually be, increase our accuracy of diagnosis looking at markers for Alzheimer's disease. It's like people go all about the town and the whole way. We can actually measure the town and the whole way in the spinal fluid. Somewhat paradoxically, the amyloid level in Alzheimer's actually goes down. It's working. All right. Uh, the amyloid levels actually go down in the spinal fluid. The thought is it gets caught up in those plaques and doesn't get released from the spinal fluid. The tau protein actually goes up, and that's probably because those cells with that, those tangles are dying, and they release that tau protein into the spinal fluid. So we actually look at the ratio of those, and that gives us a pretty good idea of whether there's Alzheimer's changes in the brain uh, going on. We also will look under structure and see that the memory area of the brain, called the hippocampus, um, I like hippopotamus. Hippopotamus, I mean, I think means a river animal or water animal. Hippocamp, river cow, river horse, horse. Well, hippocampus means seahorse, so that's where those. Do. Thank goodness we got somebody who knows some good language. Um, anyway, um, I mean seahorse. I was forgetting what the promise was. But we tend to see shrinkage in that in that memory area of the brain. Okay, everybody needs to look at their cell phones right now. Um, there's something called PET or SPEC imaging, where we can look at how, how sugar is used in the brain, and there are some patterns there that are not diagnostic, but can kind of give us a clue. I often will use this imaging where I'm not sure if this person really has anything going on, right? And, and I'm a little bit worried that I'm not sure that if I see an abnormality, it'll make me feel more likely something is going, something is going on. Um, this is a kind of image we use now where we measure the dopamine system. This was originally shown in Parkinson's disease that you see a reduction in the dopamine system here versus normal. It does not pick out Alzheimer's, but it does pick out something called Lewy body dementia, which we're increasingly recognizing. It's probably the second most common cause of dementia out there. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about amyloid imaging, and that's gotten a lot of press. That actually has been approved by the FDA. However, Medicare, Medicaid, and insurance doesn't cover it. So you can look and actually see the aggregation of the amyloid in the brain with this amyloid scan. This scan will only cost you six to seven thousand dollars. <laughs> So when I have people say they don't want to do the spinal tap for the amyloid and tau, and I say it's covered, 
gonna cost you a $25 copay or six or seven thousand dollars. It's amazing how people suddenly think, just file a tax <laughs> Now we're gonna be interested to see where that cutoff is, that financial cutoff. Six to seven thousand. Six to seven. Oh. Six to seven. Oh. I mean, maybe six to seven doesn't seem like a whole lot to you. <laughs> 67 does sound like a whole lot. Uh, um, so that's one of the issues that we struggle with with the amyloid imaging is that it's just too, it's just too expensive. As I said, if we're screening people for amyloid in the brain and there are 35 million people in the country that have it, let's say you have to screen 10 per 20, 30 percent of their negative. Now what's 40 million times six, seven thousand dollars? That'll bust almost anybody's budget, even if it's not 67. Uh, thank goodness that's not that. Um, so treating the dementias. So this guy said I took a ginkgo pill to boost my memory, a diet pill to boost my energy, and a ginkgo pill to boost my energy. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there's so much out there now, but it used to be ginkgo was kind of a hot item for a while. Uh, and actually ginkgo is kind of, it's a bit of a stimulant. So it's like drinking a cup of coffee. So people do feel a little bit more alert, feel like they're a little sharper when they take it. Um, no evidence that it actually treats the disease, but you, know, you drink a cup of coffee and maybe you get a little bit better when you're having a cough like this. So what are the approved treatments? Well, there are four approved treatments. Three of them are essentially identical. Um, they all work on the same chemical system of the brain called the acetylcholine system. They inhibit the breakdown of that chemical in the brain to allow it to stick around a little bit longer. Um, and again, all three drugs work pretty much the same. Um, even though a lot of times I hear a lot of negative things about these drugs, because they are very modest in their effect, thank goodness now they're generic, so they're relatively inexpensive. Um, but actually, all these drug trials you hear about that are negative, over and over again, these drugs have been shown to be effective in helping people with their memory. Now it's on very modest effects, so this is this is a study showing about a, a five to 10 point difference on a 70 point scale. So it's not like people are back to normal. And in fact, what you see is after about a year, people are about where they started out. So I get patients come back and they come back and they say, well, it's about the same as it was a year ago. Maybe we should just stop it. But what we know is that those who didn't get it kind of continue to decline. So it doesn't treat the disease, it's symptomatic. It's like taking an aspirin for a headache when you have a brain tumor, it helps with the symptoms. Um, but there is, again, repeatable evidence that these class of drugs does help. So most of us that work in the field do try to get people started on one of these three medications, the Aricep, the Exelon, and the Mazadone. One of the other benefits of these drugs, and that's why I mentioned it earlier, is it actually does often help with apathy. This is a placebo-controlled trial. We saw an improvement in apathy in the treated group versus the placebo group. And that's also been shown over and over again. So what I often hear from family members is their memory's not any better, but during the conversation, they're a little bit quieter. They're following the conversation. In and out, memory's a little bit better. Uh, and so one of the side benefits of, of this drug is it can improve that, that apathy that's often Innumerable patients of mine come on an antidepressant and the family says it's not helping, he's not getting out of the chair, he still doesn't talk at the dinner table. Um, they, they treat him with this drug and they come out of their shell a little bit on all the patients. It's not clearly evident here, but actually one of the other reasons I like to give this drug, particularly in patients with Lewy body dementia, where you're gonna develop hallucinations, they're gonna see things, is that actually there's some benefit on hallucinations. So some of the benefits aren't so much the cognitive as it is the behavioral effects of the drug. The other drug that's been approved besides those three is called Nemenda or Menagene. It's working on a different system of the brain. It's actually trying to dampen that system. It's been feeling as if it's overactive in Alzheimer's disease. And originally there was thought that that overactivation might actually be causing brain damage, causing cells to die, and that maybe this drug would be preventative and actually treat the disease itself. Unfortunately, those studies have not, studies have not shown that. Um, when we do a trial like this, we put people either on a memantine or placebo, there is a bit of a benefit for the memantine, but when we take them off the drug, they both come right back together again. So 
So there's no evidence that it actually treats the disease itself. It's a symptomatic drug. What most of us do is we, the best evidence for its effectiveness is in moderate to severe dementia. So for a lot of patients, what we do is we add it on top of a drug like the Aricept, the Exelon, the Razadon. Um, that's a secondary drug, so we add them together. And there's evidence here that together these drugs are better than, than by themselves. So a lot of other kinds of therapies that we do, there are a lot of things that we treat in dementia. This is why it's good to see a doctor, especially one who's, who's experienced working with dementia. Um, I talked about apathy being treated with these cholinergic drugs. Also just social activity. These patients don't have an internal drive. They just schedule something to take them somewhere, go visit the grandkids, they go out to their favorite restaurant, they go dancing, we referenced earlier. They still can enjoy themselves. They're just not going to have that internal drive to do that. So you have to kind of pick that up for them. Irritability is something very common, um, right? Just trying to get them into the shower for the first time in a week, um, really struggling. Some caregiver education is, is, is helpful to some caregivers who but he hasn't taken a shower in a week. I say, just you know, chill out for 20 minutes and come back, because he's not going to remember you were trying to get him into the shower. And a lot of times you go back a second or a third time. And their mood is different and they go right on in. So um, just being patient um, can often be very difficult. Um, we have had a lot of success treating irritability with an old antidepressant called sertraline. It's something we use a lot of often. Take the edge off of that, particularly with patients getting a little bit more, more combative during that time. Psychosis, hallucinations, and false beliefs. If they're not problematic, we don't treat them because the antipsychotics um, actually associated with increased risk for death, and mortality, and morbidity in dementia patients. Um, when we need to use them, we try to use as low a dose as possible. But again, those are not only people where we are calling the police, or we have patients, for example, now have something called cat car syndrome, where uh, he, he believes that his wife is not his wife. He can sort of look at him and say, you look just like my wife, but I know he's not my wife. So he's literally called the police when she's driving away and says, she, this woman came in and just stole my wife's car. Um, and so we have to treat that. Uh, so these false beliefs. Sleep disturbance, I try to avoid medication if at all possible, because um, it's usually sleep hygiene. And um, I, you know, usually, particularly in some, some places, long-term care facilities, et cetera, they're putting people to bed at seven. He's taking a couple of naps during the day. Of course he's at three, he's already had eight, 10 hours of sleep in 24 hours. Um, so trying to, to move that schedule around, reduce the number of naps, putting them to bed a little earlier, the classic sleep hygiene things. We do know that this disease can affect the sleep areas of the brain, and so that, that regulation of sleep isn't as good as it should be. So you have to kind of put some parameters on that. So where do we go from here? Uh, well, as I mentioned already, um, a lot of efforts has gone towards trying to get rid of the amyloid from the brain, either to prevent it from being deposited or get rid of it once it's there. Probably the most excitement has been around immunotherapies. And this is a uh, uh, cover of Nature where they first developed the mouse model for Alzheimer's. So they basically gave it Down syndrome. They took this mouse and they inserted multiple copies of that amyloid gene, not just three copies, like a dozen copies. And the mouse actually started to develop these plaques like we see in Alzheimer's disease. What was even more exciting was a couple of years later, um, uh, Dale Shank, a brilliant guy, uh, working with a company, um, said, what well, could we vaccinate against that amyloid? Could we re induce the immune system to get rid of the amyloid? And so what they did in these transgenic mice that had the amyloid, they did in saline here, and they spelled plenty of amyloid in their brain. Uh, but this is the group that got vaccinated against the amyloid and essentially went to zero. Um, and I would say if you're a transgenic mouse, this is by far the best treatment for you. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, most of those working in the field said that's it. Or everybody's going to get a vaccination, cure Alzheimer's, start working more in Parkinson's disease. Um, 
But unfortunately, they went, they went first, actually, this is a very important message. Um, first, they went through a, a safety trial in normal, 80 normal individuals, no problem. You know, they wanted to get this out there because it looked so promising. Gave 300 some plus Alzheimer's patients, and a significant percentage of them developed an encephalitis and actually got really, really sick. A couple of lessons here. Number one was um, now you often see phase one studies using the drug in people who have a, the disease you're trying to treat. Because these people didn't have the amyloid in their brain, so they have no immune reaction in their brain. These people did, and when they had that immune reaction, some of them developed the immune response. And the other problem there was it was a vaccination, so you can't stop it. Once you've vaccinated somebody, it's there forever, right? Their immune response is always going to be there. So, um, so that was rapidly discontinued, lessons learned, and quickly thereafter, people said, well, let's do something where we can control the immune response. So let's infuse antibodies. Rather than inducing the person to develop their own antibodies, we'll infuse them, and we can stop infusing them when people develop an immune response and stop that. And so you see that, and it's actually worked out really well in terms of that side effect. There have been a number of trials using these antibodies against amyloid. Um, there's been a little bit of a signal, um, but not a strong enough signal to approve therapy. Probably the most, the one that I've been most excited about lately is something called aducanumab. This was this, this was the original phase one B study. So this was in patients looking both at, at safety, but also a little bit at outcome. And what they saw was that people who got the higher dose of the antibody infused had reduced amyloid on imaging in their brain actually did better on the initial test and on um, a scale of how, how much problem they were having on a day-to-day -day basis. It was a very small study, 137 subjects, but four different conditions, which means that you split that number up. So each group had 30 or 40 patients. So you can be very careful. You can have a, a false positive there uh, just by randomization. Um, side effects were really um, mostly that, that encephalitis, but if they stopped the infusions, which they did on a monthly basis, people were not universally recovered. So very nice safety profile from that perspective. That trial is going on. In fact, that trial, uh, which we participated in, has finished enrollment patients, and by the end of next year, we should have a, a result, so we're keeping our, our fingers crossed. So there have been a lot of failures. There's been a lot of dis disappointment in that. Um, uh, one, one thought about why some of these trials have failed is that they did it too late. As I mentioned earlier, we think those plaque and tangles can be there up to 10 and 20 years before you develop symptoms. And so a lot of studies, and there's a list of four different studies, are trying to treat people before they actually get any kind of clinical symptoms. And that may be where we ultimately go in the long run. Um, some of them are looking at people who carry genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's. Some are just looking at older individuals who have imaging or spinal fluid that suggests that they have an amyloid in their brain, and giving them this drug to prevent the onset. A host of other medications that are being tried. Um, in fact, I put this together. There are over 1,900 drug trials listed in clinicaltrials.gov of the relationship to Alzheimer's disease. It's got Alzheimer's in there. So lots and lots of work being done despite the fact that some companies have popped out of this area. So what do we need? We definitely need improved recruitment. Um, so if you saw our little table there, we have a research registry that I want you to, to, to take a look at. Um, registering doesn't mean you have to do anything other than just get a call and say, gee, you qualify for something, would be interested. And a lot of our studies involve people who don't have problems. Um, we have to compare people with Alzheimer's or with other kinds of dementia to people who are doing well. Um, and actually, that's often the hardest, hardest group to recruit. Um, we do need to improve our diagnosis, particularly for people with multiple pathologies, so we need better biomarkers, both for diagnosis, as well as we need a biomarker to tell us when are we actually treating the disease well. Um, so one of the things for those of, for those of us who are men, you get your prostate, you get your genetically checked in your blood. If you're getting cancer, that, that biomarker goes up, you treat the cancer, it goes down. We need something similar for Alzheimer's and other dementias. 
we are starting to look now at disease modifying therapies. Um, so it's, it's very exciting. Again, we need better progression markers. There is this increased focus on not just amyloid, but the tangles. We have a tangle study we're doing right now called Tango. Um, and some of these other changes in the brain, the Lewy bodies, there's a lot of interest in how the immune system might be progressed. As I said, you do, you do have to be kind of careful what you wish for. As I said, right now, um, there are estimated 38 million people who have some amyloid in their brain. How are we going to identify those people? How are we going to identify the ones that are going to develop Alzheimer's disease and dementia versus those who are not? So a lot of work that we still need to do in this area. What can you do? Um, you can do crossword puzzles. In my mind, exercise is still probably the best thing that you can do for your brain. And that includes not just cardiovascular, but a little bit of weightlifting. It doesn't have to be heavy. Um, and balance. So all three of those things, I think, we're increasingly seeing are important. And especially as you get older, um, less cardiovascular. I'm sorry? All right. Don't break a leg or a nose. <laughs> uh, playing soccer still, which is good. Um, get a diagnosis. There are a number of reasons. I, I get this question of why, why is this diagnosis important? Well, number one, we want to make sure you do have Alzheimer's. You don't have something else going on, or there isn't a modifier that we need to, to check into. We are starting to see, for example, the immune system. There's a, there are immune system related branches, and I've treated some of those patients, and they've gotten significantly better. Stabilized it better. So getting an accurate diagnosis is important. The other thing that I try to tell my, my internal medicine colleagues is we spend so much effort right treating this, the, the cholesterol, getting their diabetes under control, and you're wondering why after they get dementia all that goes you know down the tubes. Does your patient forget to take their medicine and not taking it correctly? So increasingly we're recognizing that recognizing somebody's having an issue start to intervene with things that allow them to get the medication for all their other problems in a correct way. And then finally, what can you do? You can participate in research. Please take a look at our table there. Jessica, are you our representative today? Raise your hand so people know who you are. Uh, so please call, talk to Jessica. There's good evidence that these kinds of changes make a difference. This is an African-American community study that was looking at the frequency of dementia in, in solid lines here in, by age in an African-American community back in uh, the 1990s and then in the early 2000s. And the only difference between this lower bar and this bar here um, is that uh, we're, we saw an increase in treatment of things like diabetes, hypertension, and depression. So this group was getting, you would think they'd actually get worse, but actually what was happening is people were getting diagnosed, getting treated for these things, and it actually led to a reduction in the frequency of dementia. As I mentioned, most dementia is mixed. To treat things like hypertension, you're less likely to have strokes, you're less likely to aggregate that. So these are things that clearly make a difference. Um, we're working to try to get to a funding for a, a statewide, well actually a Cleveland-wide um, uh, Alzheimer's Center. Um, this is the group that I work with. Please come to our table and check us out. I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Evans. My mic's not on. So I know we were, we were running a little bit behind the start. We're good. Wait, do we have any, can we take a couple questions? Yeah, I can take a couple questions. Wait for the microphone. That one right here. I've got Alzheimer's. Uh, you said something about computer operation. Mm -hmm. I've had that for years. Uh -huh. I've had that for years. I was going to give an operation fixed, mm -hmm. but it was going to make the Alzheimer's. Yeah, there's always a hard question. I think that's a good general question is um, if people get worse after surgery, should I have a surgeon? I think it depends a little bit on the severity of the problem. Um, and also you should look at what kind of anesthesia they want to do. For example, some surgeries, not so much high hernia, but of the leg or foot, you can use a, a local anesthetic 
and not use a general anesthesia, because general anesthesia just seems to cause more problems. But if you have to have the surgery, you have to have the surgery. <laughs> I, I don't want to be the one, I don't want to get the advice from the uh, lectern here, um, but it's usually I'm sitting down with the family and, and sort of discussing the pluses and the minuses. Now, I, in my own personal experience, my mother, as I said, had Alzheimer's, she fell, she broke her hip, right, classic thing. I go, okay, this is gonna go down the hill. She had no problem. The only difficulty she had, she wouldn't keep her legs still right after surgery because she denied that she had broken her hip or had surgery. She thought we were, she thought we were joking. So, we're pulling my leg, which we did all the time. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, so, that, so some people do very well. But it is important to, to, to take that into consideration when you're thinking about the surgery. Any other questions? We do know there's a group of people who just have amyloid in their brain um, and five years later have not changed at all in their thinking skills. We don't know why, well, we have some ideas, but we don't know why some people in that five year period do progress to develop a dementia or monotonic impairment versus those who don't. That's one of the things that we're, we're looking at. So it doesn't mean absolutely that you will. And that's very important because if we have these therapies, that are treating the disease itself that have some significant side effects. And we want to treat people early. We have to figure out, in these research ideas, how do we figure out who is going to progress and who isn't. We have some ideas, but we don't, we don't have that problem. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, you mentioned that there's I watched a program on television, and it said that the tangles around the brain, it was initially thought that that was what was causing the Alzheimer's, and now they have found that it actually is protecting the brain from the Alzheimer's. Have you heard that? I have not heard that. Okay. Um, so That's why I'm asking. Right. So I think most people in the field feel the tangles are a good marker for the cells aren't working right, and that as you develop the tangles, you're more likely to get dementia, and that's why clinical symptoms but that it's not causative, because we see tangles develop in other brain diseases as well. Um, so it seems to be the idea is the amyloid starts and the tangles come, come a bit later. Hi, um, I didn't see that program, but I did read The End of Alzheimer's by Bredesen, and Brett and Bredesen, he talks a lot about this tangle protecting the brain. And so I was just wondering kind of what it, is your thought on Bredesen and the protocol and, sure. and how does that kind of fit in? Um, well, um, you know, actually, uh, Bredesen is, a, is, a, is and was an excellent neuroscientist, so he did a lot of great work in sort of in vivo and vitro models, so PET screens and, and animal models and things like that. Um, he has this protocol he's put out where he says he's cured, I think, 12 people of Alzheimer's disease. Um, again, not, uh, nobody's gone back and looked to see that they actually have Alzheimer's disease, wasn't uh, placebo controlled, no further studies being done, but he's done very well with his book um, and with setting up his sites around the country. I just like to see a little bit more science with that because um, there's really no evidence right now that it, it really does much, um, other than maybe a, you know, a, a, a wallet biopsy. Um, so it will cost you some money to do. Um, what I can tell you from tangles is just that, again, we don't see the dementia until the tangles appear. Um, and that as a pathologist, as well as a neurologist, when I look at the brain and somebody who's died with Alzheimer's, I see dead areas where dead cells were, and there's always a tangle there. There's a tangle where you have dead cells. And so our assumption right now is it's not a good thing to, to die from. It may be the cell is trying to, and, and this may be where he's trying to go, the response of the cell to the injury from the amyloid uh, in some way. Um, but it, 
seems to be when that happens, it just starts to happen. Dr. Lindgren? I would like to circle back to something that came up a few minutes ago with this gentleman in the front. I think it's important enough to bring up, and that is the use of general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, for decades, I have watched this. Uh, by fractured repair, the individual recovers well physically, cognitively, it changes their life um, exponentially. I also have been a part of helping people advocate as they are facing these uh, surgeries. And can you tell me whether or not there is a general awareness in the medical community of the effects of, of general anesthesia on older persons? And is it becoming more common and encouraged for people to request spinal blocks for certain procedures, other types of anesthesia? I, I think this is something very important and people need to feel empowered to say to, you know, in their pre-surgery appointments, I'm having a, a biopsy for a, a bladder cancer. I would prefer to have a spinal block versus a general anesthesia. And I'm finding when people are strong enough to advocate for these other treatments, the, the requests are falling um, nowhere possible. Okay. Well, I, I certainly, all I can say is that I, I do think I've, I've had surgeons who are responsive to that. I have surgeons that refer people to me and say, do you think it's safe to do a cardiac surgery on this individual? Um, again, there's no absolute cutoff. I mean, obviously, if somebody is really sick and requires a surgical procedure, their dementia is not going to do very well because of the illness. So you're, you're weighing those options. But I do encourage people to be advocates <coughs> and ask, are there alternatives to general anesthesia? Do I really need this surgery? It's worth at least getting a, a second look or a second opinion about the surgery. Um, because there is a group of patients that can be very susceptible, I think both to the anesthesia, but also to the, you know, just cutting the body. Can the, can the immune system gets activated? If you're familiar, you know, I see patients with Alzheimer's who get very, very confused and they just get a urinary tract infection, which is not a surgical procedure. It's just that you're gunning up the immune system and somehow that's affecting how the brain works. So um, it is good to be very aware of that and to be an advocate. on one of my slides. So um, this is a, um, in Colombia. Going, there, stop, up, go back. There, stop. So that's this study here. Okay, this is a Colombia study. So that family has a mutation in that amyloid gene. And carrying that, that mutation gives you 100% risk of developing Alzheimer's. And they can tell whether people carry that mutation. They can also tell when they're likely to develop dementia. So they're giving them this antibody right before they think they can develop dementia based on what they've seen in the family. So they're treating these people pre-symptomatically because they can tell, they know they're at 100% risk of developing a problem with dementia. So this is one of these rare mutations. There are um, people in the US that carry mutations in that same gene, uh, the presenilin gene, uh, and, uh, and again, are 100% risk. This is a very uncommon cause, it's less than 1% of all Alzheimer's carries that mutation. Uh, but when you identify, it's a very extended family, so they can enroll 300 people into that study um, that carry that mutation. So the idea is, is can we intervene using this family as a model of Alzheimer's disease? Or people with Alzheimer's. And I think what you notice in these families with the mutation that causes is the onset's very early, like in their 40s, early 50s. Uh, we are finding in terms of genetics for later onset that people are carrying risk genes. It's sort of like smoking and lung cancer. You have a higher risk, but you're not necessarily, you're only somebody 
The smell probably would have not even never had any problems. And we know people got lung cancer and never smoked. Uh, the same is true for Alzheimer's. We know there are genes that are risk genes that would increase your risk, and actually some genes now that are risk genes that reduce your risk, uh, but they don't cause a disease. So we, we don't have a, but we do think it may influence when you get it and how you might respond to it. So that's another thing. Thank you. All right. Everyone. Thank you very much. tell you a story. Um, we are an assisted living uh, uh, provider. We made a very purposeful decision to provide both assisted living and memory care. We are known for memory care, both nationally, locally, and internationally. But in reality, our memory care program, our memory care business is only 30%. 70% is assisted living. The reason is, there's a lot of data that's coming up the last six or seven months or so that indicates that only 9% of Americans have zero risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Only 9%. Now, man, going back to the question that you asked, that amyloid plaque, um, essentially, uh, amyloid plaque is seen as a response to protecting the brain from inflammation. Is that is that what you saw on TV? Okay. Yeah, I, I, it's amyloid plaque. So now, how many of you here would like to live up to 90 years of age? Okay, good, excellent, fantastic. What if I say, if you live up to 90 years of age, there's a very good chance either you will have Alzheimer's disease or you'll be caring for one. Would you believe that? Yeah. Alzheimer's disease is like, like a glacier. It develops over time. It's not when you hit 60 or 70 or 80 that you will start coming down with the disease. 
Research shows that the disease, the amyloid plaques, or the tangles, there's a very good chance it slowly begins to accumulate, gather, begin, I want to say as early as 25 years of age. Okay? So what does it mean? What does it mean? There's a very good chance if you open my brain, there's a good chance that I may have amyloid plaques. <coughs> but I don't have the symptoms. Just because I have wrinkles, it doesn't mean that I'm old. I'm old because I hung out in the sun for a very long time, or I didn't take care of myself. I didn't eat well, I drank a lot, I smoked quite a bit. It could be many of those things. So now, as a provider, as a caregiver, as a therapist, you and I have, can we wait for another 10 years, 20 years, 30 years to find cure? or to, to uh, and, 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 and given the statistics, given the information that we have right now, can we continue to wait? We have to do something today. We have to. I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, the last three or four months, um, uh, as an occupational therapist, uh, I've started seeing patients as early as 50 years, in, in the early 50s. I worked with a client. Uh, she was, uh, I want to say about 61 or 62 years, 62 years of age. This is the interesting part. She came to me, uh, you know, with the hope that I'll be able to help her out. I spent about six weeks or eight weeks with her. Um, I, I like the walkout. I prefer the walkout over MMSC. Uh, the reason I prefer MOCA over, over MMSC, I kind of use both MOCA and MMSC. For those of you who do not know what a MOCA is and what an MMSC is, they're, they're assessment tools. Well, before I go into all the details, can I ask a quick question? How many professionals do we have here? Medical professionals who work in the nursing home, assisted living hospital, okay. Uh, caregivers, families, anyone living with the disease? Now, so when she came to me, uh, she had other um, uh, medical conditions like depression, anxiety, um, and also she was she had memory challenges. So when, when I started seeing her in my in my clinic, I, I created a program and I started working with her. Um, I administered Mocha. And she scored, I want to say, like 11, I would say, 11, 12, I forget exactly what it is. So I designed a program, I continued to work with her, I worked with her for about six weeks. Went through the process of driving, grocery shopping, she wanted to go on vacation, so I tried to figure out where she was going, drawing out the map, figuring out, figuring out where she, she, she would be living, and the minutes, the minutes that she would be accessing. She also had the brain, when they, when they did an MRI, you know, she did have amyloid, she did have claps, I mean, uh, neurofibrillary tangles. She was diagnosed as moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. After I worked with her, I was able to get her back to, you know, where she was. Then she went and saw another physician the physician told her that she didn't have Alzheimer's disease at all. The reason I share the story is, well, the x-ray is not lying. The MRI doesn't lie, right? Then she had memory loss. I worked with her. I did cognitive reformatting, cognitive restructuring, activities of daily living, all of that stuff. She started showing improvement. She went back and saw the physician. She saw another physician, and the physician said, oh, she wasn't as bad as <coughs> That's story one. I'll tell you another story. Thirdly, I personally think that I failed this client. He's a young man, came to us, and with Alzheimer's disease, with an Alzheimer's diagnosis. Early 50s was diagnosed when he was 47 or 48 a very, very successful uh, senior executive. 
We started working with him. He started, well, I shouldn't say he started, we started observing. I call dysfunctional expressions, you know, the behaviors. I call them dysfunctional expressions because every behavior is an expression. Anger, anxiety, depression, combativeness, aggressiveness. It's an expression. <coughs> it's not functional, it's dysfunctional. And we started manifesting dysfunctional expressions. And we started working with him. Now, the, we needed pharmaceutical support. Are there any medications to treat Alzheimer's disease? Any medications to treat Alzheimer's disease? There is no medication to treat Alzheimer's disease. There are medications to manage the symptoms. The symptoms such as aggressiveness, combativeness, restlessness, you know, they are managed using psychotropic drugs. There's a reason why I'm sharing this, because it is one of my frustrations, it's one of my staff's frustration, psychotropic drugs. There are typical psychotropic drugs, there are atypical psychotropic drugs. Psychotropic drugs, research shows that psychotropic drugs do more harm than any good. The most important thing is to figure out the right psychotropic drugs to address those behaviors and manage those behaviors. And that's the biggest challenge. With this gentleman, we were not able to manage his expressions. Now, my staff and myself, we cannot do it alone. This is where we need assistance from the physicians, from the hospital, using, there's no the right or said psychotropic drugs, because we, as humans, we all have different tolerances and different ability to process our drugs. So you have to really, you know, it's all trial and error. And with this gentleman, I personally felt that I was a failure because we were not able to minimize, find a way, find a way to minimize his drugs, uh, minimize his uh, uh, expressions. When when I have a client in front of me who is extremely angry, aggressive, combative, I, as an occupational therapist, I cannot do any therapies. I cannot do any therapies at all. So the most important thing is what I felt, you know, this is my frustration is I wish, you know, there are better ways to manage our client's behavior our client's dysfunctional expressions. Now with that said, I'll give you another story. Another client that we treated two, year, two years ago came to us, I, I believe if I'm not mistaken, he was 61 or 62 years old, with frontal temporal dementia, FTD. He was restless, he was aggressive, combative, he was eloping, roaming, Tearing things out, down, taking doors down, choking my caregivers, almost trying to kill one. So we were able to manage his behaviors very well with, with medications. And that gentleman ended up living and thriving in our community. Yes, sir.
Absolutely. If you're doing everything right, you're doing everything right. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it, if you don't mind, later. I'll talk a little bit about it. But I, what I want to do is, can I have a second slide, please, the next slide? You have a clicker. Oh, I do. Yeah, that's the podium. One of the things that we we did as an organization is when we looked at the disease and we spent a lot of time researching about the disease, trying to understand what the disease is all about. Not just the pathology, but also uh, the physiology of the disease um, and the anatomy of the human brain and the neurophysiology. Trying to really understand what is it we can do to help our clients live a life that is filled with some form of fulfillment. Not quality, quality is very objective. Fulfillment is very subjective. What is fulfilling to me may not be fulfilling to you. It's very, very subjective. It's purely based on how we were raised, our culture, our experiences, our lives, all of it. How do we, how do we find ways to enable our clients to live a life that's, that's fulfilling and, and, and with dignity? So, what we did was, the, the, the disease can be broken into seven stages. And uh, that's Dr. Barry Weisberg's scale. Stage one is normal. Stage two is, you know, it's normal age forgetfulness. Normal age is forgetfulness. We forget as we get older. See, our brains will shrink, as shrink as soon as we hit 40, okay? That's a, that's a normal process. I mean, like, like, like we start losing vision, we start losing you know, other, other functions, certain functions, you know, our brain starts shrinking when, you, when we hit 40. So we, we tend to forget. Just because you're forgetful doesn't mean that you have the disease. We all forget. Forgetfulness is not a symptom for the disease. It becomes a, if, if, if it becomes a problem which prevents you to live your life, puts you at risk, puts you, you know, at, uh, uh, if you're having pro challenges with problem solving, judgment skills, leaving the stove on, driving in, in, in the cul-de-sac, trying to figure out where you're going, you know, things like that, that impacts your ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis, then memory becomes a problem. Now stage three is MCI, mild cognitive impairment. That stage four is early stages, five is middle stages, six, six is late, and seven is end stages. Now, there are different, there are different classifications. You'll, you'll get mild, mildly moderate, moderately severe, and severe, that's overused here, you, you heard mild, moderate, severe. So the different ways of classifying the disease. We, we like Dr. Barry's uh, Barry Reisberg scale. Reason being is I'm able to tie each stage to uh, the, the client's ability to perform their activities of daily living. Dressing, bathing, grooming, brushing the teeth, able to dress, able to bathe. That's very important. See, a disease or a condition becomes a problem when it prevents our ability to care for ourselves and for people around us. Is that true? There's a reason why we can live with diabetes, right? But I'm still able to care for myself or care for people around me. I can live with cholesterol. Hypertension. Am I making sense? As you go through the disease process, you will see that as you progress from one stage to another, you will lose the ability to care for self and for people around us. And that's when it becomes a problem. So it, it was very important for us to really understand the stages of the disease. It was also very important for me to understand, technically, when a client is at, is uh, at the stage of MCI, they can actually live for seven years in that stage. If the client gets the right care, the right treatment, the, the individual can live seven years. The, the stage should last for seven years. The mild stage will last for two years. The moderate will last, um, I'm sorry, the middle stage will last for a year and a half. The late, Two and a half years, 
and the, la the, the, the end state is about a year and a half. If you add all these years, you could, after you're diagnosed, you can actually live a quality life for about 20 years. I'm not saying it. That's what research shows. You really can live up to 20 years. Are we able to live, are, are, as a clinician, as a caregiver, as a provider, when we see our clients, are, they, are we able to provide that level of care, the quality of care, the services that they need so that they can continue to live and go through these stages and live up to 20 years of age? Uh, to, to 20 years, live up to 20 years. You know, these are the questions that we started asking ourselves. Now, we also, what I did was, when I was looking at Dr. Bill Weisberg's scale, I started looking at, okay, I started comparing the cognitive capacity or the cognitive functions. Now, what I did was, uh, um, there's an occupational therapist out of California. Uh, I, I forget her name. She did a lot of work with schizophrenia and uh, depression and anxiety. Uh, and she came up with a cognitive skill. So I studied her breakdown, you know, and it's Claudia Allen, by the way, this came to me. Um, <laughs> her name is Claudia Allen. And uh, she did, she broke the cognitive abilities and cognitive capacities with that, with that patient population. So what I did was, as an occupational therapist, I, I took that various Bay Reisberg scale, and I married that scale to Claudia Adams. There's a reason why I did that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you, okay, why I did that. Now, when the client is at stage two, okay, which is normal age, age forgetfulness, the cognitive ability is very close to about, close to a 25 year old. Okay. When the client is at stage at, at, uh, stage, stage three, which is MCI, mild cognitive impairment, they are their cognitive ability is between a teen, you know, between between thirteen and twenty years of age. Why is this important? See, as you see, as you go down the stages, teenager to a twenty-year-old, four to a twelve-year-old, eighteen months to a three-year-old, twelve to eighteen months old. Stage three is an infant. Why is this breakdown important? This breakdown is important because as a caregiver, when I know that my client, I'll just give you an extreme. When my client is at stage seven as an infant, okay, which is end stage, I am not gonna take my client, have my client sit in a jerry chair or in a wheelchair and wheel the, my client into a shower and turn the water on. See, when I was a, when I was a young man practicing occupational therapy in nursing home twenty years ago, we did that. It is so important because how do you how do you bathe an infant? How do you care for an infant? You you have to inspire confidence. They have to trust you. You, you play with them, you play some form, some, some kind of music, or you, you know, try to bond with them, and then they will participate. We as caregivers and we as therapists, we always have struggles and challenges because I am not able to get my client, I'm not able to bathe my client. Make sense? Am I making sense? Same thing, when you go back, when you go up to stage five, that the client is between the cognitive ability or the or the cognitive capacity is between an eighteen month old, uh, is between an eighteen month year old and a three year old. When my son was three years old, he wore the same pants and same shirts and same underwear every single day. <laughs> How do I manage him? What do I do? I mean, do you have clients who do that? Make sense? Yeah. Why this breakdown is so important? Because see, as a provider, you know, for me, it was very, very important to give some information to my caregivers so that they understand how they can, what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, how to engage with them. Now, you as a family member, you may have a parent, 
or you may have someone in your family that is going through these stages. It is so important for us to understand what stage the client is. Very, very important. Stage three, this, this, is, a, this is a struggle for us. Families come in, they bring the loved ones, and they'll say, my mom is forgetful, I think my mom has dementia, but I don't want her on the dementia unit. I want her on the AL side. Because that's where she's, he or she's gonna get a lot of stimulation. Or they will say, you know what, my mom has always been like this all her life. She's upset, she's angry, she's this, she's that, and they, they Sometimes, I see, not this happens all the time, but sometimes with my own with families, they say they don't give them mom or dad an opportunity to be who they are. We all know that when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, we retrogenesis, we revert back, we revert back to early childhood days. Okay? Now when you revert back to early, early childhood days with Alzheimer's disease, what is compromised? Short-term memory or long-term memory? Short-term. Long-term is still there. Why is long-term still there? There's a scientific reason behind it. It's be because of my, the big one. Yes, ma'am. Our neurons go through, go through a process called myelination. And, and all the memories that are associated when during that process, actually the long the, is the last one to go. Okay? So, now, let's say I have Alzheimer's disease. I'm, at, I'm here, right? I, I'm stage three today. And my thought process, my memories, could be very, very close and similar a 20 year old. Okay, so I am going back to 1980s, or 1990s, I'm sorry, 1990s. That's the world I am in. I am in 1990, brother. <laughs> and you come and tell me, you know, Mr. Trump is the president, I'm gonna say you're full of nonsense. Make sense? It is so important. See, the thing is, once you understand this, it makes it a lot more easier for us, easier for our, for, for our family members or the clients that we work with. We know where they are. Every single day, it is so important for us as caregivers, as, pay, uh, as a therapist or family members, for us to know where my mom is, where my dad is. My mom could be in 1920s. She could be at 1930s, 1930s. It's no point me injecting my word into hers. What, what happens when I inject my word into hers? Frustration. Frustration leads to what? Agitation. Anger. Then what else? Combativeness. Aggressiveness. And then what do we do? Slap her with a psychotropic drug. Make sense? It is, it, this is, fair, and I'm sorry, I'm not able to go into details because of the limitation of time. I'm gonna jump from, you know, from this to another one, but from one topic to another real quick. But this breakdown is so important. One of the things we also realize is, I call them virtues. I don't like deficits, the word deficits. To me, that we all have deficits. Okay, I, you know, we all have deficits. Why do we categorize people into a certain club, group, saying that they, 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 they have this deficiency? So what I do is I call them virtues. So in a normal age, normal age forgetfulness is anxious, being at a state of anxiety. You're always anxious. You wanna, you know, that's what happens when you're a 25 year old. I mean, you, you, you know what's going on. Oh, I can do, I can do. Is there any 20 year old here, 25 year old here? Oh, well, I feel like that's not how I was. Now, when you come down, then, Stage three, I call them, they're very sharp. Very, very sharp. There are days they will, they're right on the ball. There are days they will say something and you think they, they I, I think she's right or he's right, but that's not true. Mom will say, 
oh, they didn't, they didn't give, me, give me my medication, or they didn't give me food. And we automatically tend to believe that. Or mom would say, I saw something, or, well, we, the, well, there's yes and no. Because I had a client 15 years ago, she kept telling me that there's something up in the roof. And she was right. After six months, we figured out there was. We, there was a crater in the roof. We did figure that out. We, we found that out. So you, you really have to know. You know. I'm not saying don't believe them, but just, you know, th there are situations like that. So when, when they are at stage four, which is early stage, they're kind of vague. You know, you ask them a question, they're not able to respond, they're kind of vague, they give you two things, the, the response is in general. Now, this is stage five. This is very important. They're in the moment. If they're in 1930s, they're in 1930s. If they're in 1940s, they're in 1940s. They're living in the moment. Okay? Stage six, they're scrambling. They're trying to figure out. You know, you see them walking around, picking stuff up, doing things that for you doesn't make any sense. Stage seven is when they withdraw themselves. They go into a shell. They don't say anything to you. Okay? Now, can, can, can an individual, are these stages defined? Like the way I, I, uh, I described it? Not really. Today they could get stage three, tomorrow they could get stage four. They move back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But as a caregiver and as a care provider, if we know what the breakdown is, what the stages are, it really helps. I, there's something called a great experience. See, we as human beings, we do not like moderate or, or less than great experiences. It's great that we love good experiences, that's not true. I'll tell you a story. How many of you have gone on a cruise ship? Multiple cruise ships, multiple cruise liners, different cruise liners. So the first time when you get into a cruise ship, on a cruise ship, you come back and say, oh, it's amazing, I loved it. It's beautiful. Let's say I'm going to use the word, I'm going to just pick a cruise liner. It doesn't mean that this is what, how they are. Let's say that um, uh, Royal Caribbean. Then the second cruise you take, you take a Norwegian. Then if I ask you, how was, how was your experience? You say, you know what? Oh, Norwegian was better, it was great. Oh, Royal Caribbean now. See, we as humans, we always love great experiences. That's why we go to Disney World. We, 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 we don't like just moderate or good experience. We need more. Okay? Now, I'm going to use my mom. My mom has Alzheimer's disease, you know, for the sake of discussion. When I go down to see my mom, I want to make sure that she has a great experience. It's not about me. It's about my mom having a great experience. You know, when there's a disruption in great experiences, in a relationship between a husband, wife, brothers, brother, sisters, father, mom, I mean, father, child, mom, child, a disruption occurs when, when the great experience is crushed or challenged. A great experience is questioned or challenged, in my mind, is when you start impressing your role. When you start impressing your authority. I am your dad. I am your husband. I am your wife. But rather, when you get together, and all you worry about is, okay, it's 11.30. I want to have a great experience. It's all about, we're not going to impress our role. We're gonna, I'm going to find where my mom is. Is she in 30s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s? What, what year she is in? What era she is in? I'm going to dive into her world and really enjoy the time that I have with my mom. See, you, you, we, us as humans, we, we, we all have rituals. We all have rituals. Think about it for a second. Every morning you get up in the morning. Every morning you get up. From the time you wake up from your uh, when you when you wake up, you get off your bed, and uh, until the second you get out, you follow a routine. 
every single day. If anyone distracts you from the routine, you are not happy. Okay? Think about it for a second. We are humans that have habits, that have rituals. I always get dressed in my closet. <laughs> yes, I do, my walking closet. And if you guys, if you, if I have the disease, and if you try to dress me a bedside, I'm gonna fight you. Then you will refer me to therapy. And I will be slapped with psychotropic drugs. Now, how many of us know our clients or our family members so very well? It is so important. See, hearing becomes a lot easier if we know who, everything about that, uh, that client. I always, okay, I always foam up my face, brush my teeth while my, while my face is foam, because I have this feeling that the foam is going to soak my beard, it's going to make it easier for me to shave, I'm going to brush my teeth, then I'll shave. Now, if you shave me first, I am not brushing my teeth for you. <laughs> <laughs> am I making sense? Yes. That is the level of understanding we as caregivers need to have. I always tell my family, I, I have only 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna just fly through this, I'm sorry. I always tell my children the stories. The girls that I dated, the, the bridges that sat under and smoked a cigarette. I mean, they're little. Sometimes I feel like I'm abusing my children. But the thing is, think about this for a second. If I, have, if I come down with a disease, if I'm in 1980s and 1990s, there's no way I will be in a position to recognize my wife. I'm thinking of someone else. <laughs> Am I making sense? I wasn't making a joke, but. The, the key thing is, then I, then, then I walk up in front of the mirror and look at myself and I go like, who is that poor bastard? <laughs> That's not me. I'm a 19 year old. Have you, have you experienced those things? It is so important for us to understand the rituals, the experiences, the great experiences, because you know, it's not about us. It is about them, knowing who they are and, and how they did stuff. I have a friend, she was telling me that, just, just a thought, uh, she was telling me that she's, you know, every night before she goes to bed, she'll motion up. And one day she was so tired, so exhausted, she just didn't have the time to motion up, and she laid in her bed. She just couldn't sleep. She had to get up, lotion up, and boom. Now, if my client is having difficulty sleeping, do you think there's something going on there? What I'm trying to say is I'm not saying that every day there's something going on. What I'm asking is to think, to take a step back, dial back a little bit, and look at the client, or the, the, the family member that we care for. It is so important, so important. I want to talk a little bit about behaviors, dysfunctional expression, real quick. So the biggest challenge as a caregiver and as a, a provider and as a therapist is when I when my client is upset, angry, frustrated, there's so much going on, and I want to do therapies. I want to care for them. I want to make sure that I'm able to dress them, bathe them, have them, you know, brush their teeth, they look good, they smell good. It's so important, you know, I feel it's so important for them. But I'm not able to do any of it because they're kicking and screaming and fighting and yelling and, and you know doing all that stuff. Now what do you? So th those are called dysfunctional expressions. Okay. Every dysfunctional expression has a trigger. Every behavior has a trigger. If anyone says they don't, they're wrong. Every behavior has a trigger. Either it's intrinsic or extrinsic. Extrinsic is from the outside. Intrinsic is from within the body, within inside. Hunger, infection, hormonal imbalance, pain. Could be multiple things. You know, have you guys 
ever felt this way that there are days that you get up in the morning and you just don't, you're just upset? You're frustrated, you're angry, you have no idea why. That's all intrinsic. Extrinsic is what I hear, what I see, what I smell, what I touch, what I feel, all of it. One of the things that we do, uh, I, I we learned, uh, you know, a couple of years ago is, when a, when, a, when a client manifests a behavior, we try our we try to find the trigger. See, if you're not if we don't if you're not able to find the trigger, you'll never be able to remove the trigger. So we try we give ourselves an hour to to find what the trigger. Sometimes it's not possible. It's not possible. Yes, that's when you need pharmaceutical intervention. You need to bring those psychotropic drugs, but. You cannot, my thing is, you don't want your client to be on that drug for a very long time. You want to wean the client out. At least minimize the use of those drugs. So it's, it's critical for us to understand what those triggers are. I mean, our children sometimes, you know, they're, so when something's going on in their life, they express to anger, right? And my son, there are times he's so upset, and I don't know what, why is he upset? What did I do? But something is bothering him. Someone said something to him in school. Or he experienced something, you know, in the bus. But they don't want to share that with us. The reason being is not they don't want to share, they don't know how to share. Children do not know how to share. Even sometimes we don't know how to share. We share with different people. So the, the most important thing is, is, is for us to understand those triggers. Once we identify those triggers and we, if we can find a way to remove those triggers from their immediate space, I think we'll be able to help them a lot more, a lot better. Um, or correct the reality, validate by listening and asking questions. I, I, I want to share this with you real quick. You know, when I, I mean, again, everything that I'm sharing is, you know, we learn a lot, quite a bit, engaging with our clients. What, uh, what we found is no, no two individuals with a disease are the same. They're not. They're similar, but they're not. Okay? So, so when I walk into you know one of the units, uh, our memory care unit, and uh, I would not say, um, hi Arthur, I would do that. Let's say I'm gonna say, you know, Arthur doesn't remember me, doesn't know what's going around him. If I say hi Arthur, he would know who the hell are you? <laughs> right? Or I would say, hi dad, how are you doing? Well, I haven't seen my dad for three months. I don't know who. Why is he calling me dad? Who is he? You know, I'm still in high school. How am I, you know, how, why? You see that? So I, that's when I don't enforce my role or my position or my title. I would just go up and say, hi, how are you doing? Oh my God, you look so handsome. <laughs> found this. Anyone with a compliment, and you know, with kindness and low frequency tone, and you get to their level. No one likes to be lectured, right? No one likes to be lectured, right? No one likes to be asked questions. You know, if I'm able to get to the level and say, and I start talking about their looks, what they're wearing, how they smell, they go like, who the heck is this guy? I like this guy. I want to talk to this guy. So, you start, and they start engaging. Then what happens is, there's something called a memory retrieval. Doesn't matter how much, where you are with the disease. We have the ability to trace back certain memories. So when I start engaging and talking, talking about, I'm not asking questions. You know, many times, one of the things I see is parents come in and go like, 
Uh, Mom, did you have your medication this morning? What do you have for breakfast? I'm like, how would she know? Now all of us, I go like, why is she asking me that? I'm just really upset. Who, who is very excited about actually being forgetful? <laughs> Happy, joyous, any of us? I mean, for being forgetful is the worst thing, right? I mean, if I can't find my car key, my go I start blaming everyone around me. You know? So, I always, you know, I mean, again, we're all humans, we make mistakes, I'm not making, I'm not making joke or fun or I'm not trying to be derogatory in any manner. I'm just saying this is what happened. So normally I when I engage, I am always complimenting the, the blouse, the color, the scarf, the, what they're wearing, what they're doing, and ask them to teach me what they're doing, and all of a sudden they are in they feel like they're they're important. Who, who is it like talking about themselves? <laughs> we all do. Trust me, we all do. Even the one that's very, very shy and quiet. And that's why selfies are so popular. <laughs> <laughs> Before the cameras came on board, I, I was telling Heather, my assistant, I mean, we didn't have a camera, right? We, I mean, right now, even on LinkedIn, people are taking pictures and posting. I don't understand that. That's a professional uh, network. Why are you doing selfies? Uh, on your LinkedIn page. But the key thing is we love ourselves. <laughs> Not just we love, we want to make sure that we look okay <laughs> and everyone's going to appreciate us. How many times when you go to the when you go to some Macy's or any department store, you come come close to a pillar and you step back and you go look and then go again? <laughs> <laughs> same story. You know, I put it in the driveway, I put it in my garage, I open my door, my dog sees me, it's super excited, my wife right in the kitchen, not very excited. <laughs> <laughs> I look at her, and I want something really bad, I'm going to help myself. I'm not going to ask for anything, I'm going to do it on my own. Why? Why? Because I know her personality. I know she's angry, or she's upset, she's frustrated, something is going on. Maybe someone said something to her at the hospital, or maybe someone said something about me to the hospital. So I know her personality. 
Now my question is, do we know our clients' personalities? Yeah. What makes them angry? What brings joy to them? What makes them happy? What makes them help them to cooperate, participate, engage with you? Do we know that? Yes. And the only way you would know is spending a lot of time with them, right? Mm -hmm. See, I tell Heather that she knows me so well now when I walk into my office and she knows when to say something, when not to say something, when to ask for something, when not to ask for something, and she knows how to tap them too. <laughs> she'll set me up and then she'll ask. Okay? Now, how does she do that? Because she has spent majority of her time, work life, life with me, right? She's, she knows me very well. But if she did not spend time with me, I have the disease that she's my caregiver, will she be able to elicit, enable me to participate in anything that she wants me to do? One of the things that I'm asking, so we, we developed eight nine questions to understand our clients' personalities. And I'll be more than happy to send this over to you guys. If you're interested, please you know, give your email address. You know, I'll send the entire slide uh, to you. Really getting to understand who the client is. And I'll tell you something, and Shannon can vouch for this. Shannon is a sales, uh, uh, sales, sales and marketing director. She engaged, she's on, on a daily basis, she's talking to families. When we give these questions, I mean, nothing against uh, the families. They can't even fill this. They don't have the answers. How many of you have shared your life stories with your children? Very good. Because if, God forbid, if you come down with the disease, you are back there. And the, the only way I'm able to engage with my dad or with my mom is when I, I know the answer. Some of the answers I would say. You know, who tell something about your best friend. And they will tell something about the best friend. And then I know what why they have chosen this friend, or why this friend is this person is the best friend. You know, tell one of your vivid and unforgettable memories of you. There are about eight, nine questions. Uh, I'll happy to send uh, this uh, the, the, the questionnaire. We developed it in-house, you know, we felt it was uh, we needed to know all this information so that my staff and ourselves, we can engage with them in a very meaningful way. Make sense? Yeah. What is your favorite do uh, doll or toy? That's right. I mean, little, little things, it really helps. You know, see, my, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, I love Batman. I'm not a Spider-Man guy. I like Batman. Because I like that guy, he hides in his mask, behind the mask, and he does all the cool stuff. No one knows what he looks like. You know, I like that. And, and if you look at the way my whole life is how I do stuff is, I'm not a very, you know, I, I like to be behind the scenes kind of guy. Josie kind of drives me up not here, but you know. Um, so that is me. I, if you know who they are, what they are, kind of you like, yeah, I'll be engaged with them. Make sense? Um, Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, this is our treatment program. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave you, I'm, I'm almost out of time, so one of the things I wanna leave you guys with is that the most important thing, what I, when, you, when you look at, when you look, study the human brain, the most important thing is we gotta find a way to increase the blood flow to the brain, that's it. That's it. What, what does blood do? What does the blood do? What does the blood flow do? Gains nutrition. Nutrition, oxygen, nutrition. The, your, your, your neurons need. Okay? I'll tell you something very interesting. You love this, actually. Do you know how many nerve cells are in our brain? Over a trillion. Okay, and uh, the doctor talked about synapses. Remember, he talked about synapses, the connections. You know how many connections are there? 
that are over three trillion connections. So if you line up every neuron that is in your brain, and if you connect them with those connections, you and I can go to the moon and come back. That's what is in our brain. In our three pound brain. Three pound brain. For every heartbeat. Heartbeat, breath is pushed. 30 to 40% of the blood goes to the brain. I'm 187 pounds. 40% of the blood that gets pumped out goes to my brain. 60% goes to the other 184 pounds. Can I give you an idea? That's how powerful our brain is. That's how powerful our brain is. So it's important for us to take care of our brain. And everything that you're doing, sir, is very good. Very good. The key thing is to increase the blood flow to the brain. The most important thing is to actually have the left side of the brain communicate with the right side. You know, we call that uh, hemispheric integration exercises. We know that the left controls the right, the right controls the left. So doing activities and exercises, one of the studies that we're doing right now is basketball. Does playing basketball increases the blood flow to the brain? And I, I believe it does, just in theory alone. If you see how they cross over, because anytime you cross over, you cross past midline, the right side fires, the left side fires, or if you see LeBron jump and you know, spins and goes down. Look at all of the brain neurons firing. It's one of the studies that we're gonna be doing to see what is that we can do to increase the blood flow. So there, you know, walking, running, sweating is helpful. The other day someone asked me, they wrote an article somewhere down in Europe that started, uh, talked about uh, sauna being helpful. You know, sauna helps with the disease process, and if you know about it, the only thing I can think about is when you sweat, actually, there's uh, toxins are coming out. Okay, so this is very important. In, in the past, you know, it was widely believed that people that have the disease was having having difficulty sleeping. It's the other way around. You ha we have to sleep at least for six to eight hours because there are different sleep cycles we go through, and there's one particular sleep, uh, sleep cycle where your cognition is formatted, your memories are being consolidated, and it's all moving. The brain works on wasting those memories, consolidating them, reformatting them. And if you miss that sleep, that 90 minutes of sleep, you will see an impact the following day with the way you think, the way you do stuff. So in our buildings now, we do something called the sleep studies. We monitor our clients all night, every single day. You know, if they're, what cycle they're in, how, you know, are they snoring, or if it's a deep, deep sleep. Really little, little things that we can do to help crush the toxins, okay? So uh, unfortunately, I don't have much time. I will stop here. Um, if there's time for questions, I'll be happy to take some. Gene, you have 10 more minutes. Oh, I do. You do. Ooh. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. This is my treatment. Encourage your patients to do what they cannot do. Going back to, I don't know if there are any therapists, uh, occupational physical speech therapists in the, in the room, but one of the things, you know, we as therapists, when we started working with, this is come back to 10, 10, 20 years ago, when we started working with our clients that had stroke, therapy is nothing but having them do the same thing that they cannot do. Having them do stuff that they cannot do. You retrain your brain. And so, I'll give you a fantastic example. I, I have a client, and unfortunately I was not able to work with him. He's still with us, um, you know, given my, my, my commitments and other things that I, you know, I'm not able to do what I would love to do. Um, so this gentleman had vascular dementia. There are different types of dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. There, can anyone tell me how many types, how many different types of dementia are there? Eighteen, over ninety. No, 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 more than that. One hundred eighteen. One hundred eleven. So far, one hundred eleven types of dementia so far. Okay, 
I don't know what they are, but the most common form is Alzheimer's. Then you have vascular-related dementia. You've got the Lewy body. You've got CJD, Crestos, Jacobs disease, uh, Parkinsonian type. Um, you know, uh, so there are different uh, frontal temporal, diabetic-related, alcohol-related. Uh, so there are different types of dementia. But what I've, with this gentleman, he had vascular dementia, and he has had the dementia for about five years. He was actually at another facility. He came to us. And uh, I started working with him. And he was having difficulty with speech. You know, he was having receptive issues, which means that he was not able to perceive what we were telling him, and he was not able to express also. So all I did with him was, you know, work on his speech, his reception, and his expression, over, 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 and over. I mean, we had struggles, we had some struggles. I actually got him to say, you know, the months backwards, count the numbers backwards and onwards. So, which was amazing, actually, I still have, I have that video, uh, and I was like super excited when I saw that, when I, when I saw him do that. But the key thing is, it, will I be able to do this every, with every single client? No, not really. You know, but just because I'm, I, I may not realize the results, it shouldn't stop me from doing it. You know, who gave me the permission to pick and choose who gets what? when they come to my clinic, or when they come to us. So, you know, we, we try everything that, you know, possible to help them out. But one of the things I realized was, the biggest challenge we have, when our clients come to us, I wish I could start seeing them in phase three, mild cognitive impairment. We don't get them at MCI. We get them at stage six. They are home. That's the reason why I'm telling the story. They're home, and they choose to come to us as providers, and they take time, and there are other reasons, I mean, financial reasons, other reasons, of course. By the time, the time they, they come to us, it's not too late. We're still able to, we have a client at stage six in Madison, we were able to get her to shower herself, her herself, after she came to us. And write her name. And I also write her name. Oh. So, you know, it, it's, it's very exciting, a lot of fun stuff, but the thing is, think about, there's something called as neuroplasticity. Have you heard of neuroplasticity? Our brain is plastic. You and I have you and I have the ability to mold our brain the way we want. The way we do it is purely based on the, the information that we give our brain. Okay? The best way to explain that is without going into details, when you ask a bodybuilder how he or she builds a body, they don't use the same weights every single day, do they? They don't do the same routine or pattern. In a similar fashion, it's important for us to keep learning. New learning. Not the stuff that, you know, puzzles are good. Puzzles are maintenance. See, if you don't put your brain through any pain and discomfort, you will not be able to twist those neurons. I call them twisting those neurons, creating neural networks. I always said when I was uh, when I was doing a presentation about four or five years ago, I was uh, I was traveling in Southeast Asia, and I asked them, "Okay, what are you guys doing?" And the government actually made it not it's not it was not mandatory, but they came up with a program. As soon as you hit 65, we want every one of you to, to learn two languages. <laughs> and, and and they said that the, the uh, and they and they said it was helping the elderly. Try learning a new language. Okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not very good with calculus or, or algebra, but now I'm beginning to do that. It's very painful, it hurts me. But I'm doing it because I can beat my son, right? <laughs> but it, I'm also twisting my neurons. Make sense? You have to put your, 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 your neurons through some form of discomfort and pain, okay? So one other thing is, I always say, I go back to my occupational therapy roots saying that, okay, the way you would, there's some, the brain has the ability, that it's called, I'm getting kind of getting distracted here real quick. There's something called a cortical self-repair. The brain has the ability to repair itself. We have to give, give, give the brain a chance. With vascular dementia, there's multiple compromises. Vascular compromises. So as an occupation, what we do is when a client comes to our, uh, you know, to our clinic, you know, with the diagnosis of uh, cere cerebral vascular accident, what we do is we start teaching the brain the same movements that the brain forgot. 
That is their therapy, right? honestly. If you're paying hundreds of dollars a day of an, an hour, that's what we do. It's teaching the brain the same patterns, the movements, taking the, taking the, taking the brain back to the normal developmental stages, where you, you, know, you creep, you crawl, you uh, half kneel, kneel, sit, long sitting, standing, uh, uh, and walking. So we go back to the path, we, we train our, you know, our, 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 our clients with, with stroke diagnosis. And when you look at vascular dementia, vascular dementia is similar to a stroke, really. It's multiple vascular compromises, that's all it is. In theory, we can do the same thing. But the challenge we have is, to this day, we have not seen a single client that has come to us strictly with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. There are other comorbid conditions. Hypertension, diabetes, or other diseases which becomes a contributing, aggravating factor and that really kind of starts impacting and influencing the disease process. Makes sense? So, you know, so I always say, always encourage your patients to do what they, can, what they cannot do. Um, and, uh, so, so, yeah, that's, that's my presentation. I, if you let me talk, I'll talk for another 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so we, can, we have time for a couple of questions. Anyone have questions for Jean? Raise your hand. Oh, first of all, that mic, mic is high. <laughs> you know, I like when you say how you step into, step into the world. I have a client that has uh, Alzheimer's, and sometimes it's hard to get her to shower. So I take everything into the bathroom with her and show her, you know, and then I have to step in her world for a few minutes to, so that's good to, for me to continue to do that, to, you know, step in her world for a few moments. Okay, beautiful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I, I, you know, I would go one step further. I would really talk to the family or try to figure out when did she take her baths? Was it in the evenings or was it in the mornings? In the morning. In the mornings. And, and really understand microscopically how the process occurred. You know, how did she go to the bathroom? You know, when did she go to the bathroom? Was it after breakfast or before breakfast? Was it after brushing her teeth or before brushing her teeth? Mm -hmm. You know, little things like that. Did she take a shower or was it a bath? You know, the shower. shower. Yes. And, you, she, and our daughter can't get her to take it. She says she tries, but she says, you're not the same girl. Move, just wait for me. But you were able to do that? Yes. 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 So she really has bonded with you. She sees something in you, and she values you. And, and she has a confidence. And the key thing is, a child will only, I'm not saying that our clients are children. Please don't, that's not my intention at all. I'm just looking at the cognitive abilities. We will only bond with people that we're very, very comfortable with, okay? Uh, one thing I thank you for bringing that up. Um, PTS, post-traumatic stress situation, not disorder. PTS. Uh, that's something that you may guys want to uh, pay attention to, because if you have a, if you try to touch a client and she, he or she will not allow you to touch you, there's a good chance that something may have. You know, you know, I wouldn't blame the disease process. Try and do a little bit of digging. But the reason being is, you know. In our clients, when, you, when they experienced certain things, they were not, the society was not open to or was given opportunities to express those things. So if it's an, if it's an untreated PTS, that may show up later on in life. Okay, just, just a thought. One yes. more question, Eugene. What PTS stood for? Uh, Post traumatic stress. You know, okay. oh, no, no, no. PTSD meaning problem language situation? Oh, no, no. post traumatic stress. You know, PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. And it widely was believed that PTSD was extremely, very prevalent among our soldiers. Right. That's not true. 90% is actually more than in the uh, uh, civil population. <laughs> yeah, if, see, there's a reason. Uh, Every experience that you have in your life impacts your the way you would engage or do things in your
in your life. You literally lose love. I mean, I'll just give you an example, okay? Like for example, you know, you, you were dating someone, you were you experienced something, and that was not something that was pleasant, then when you when you're getting ready to date another man, you're not giving that man a chance, an opportunity, because everything that you have is actually kind of dictating, influencing how you would engage. Am I making that? So in a very, very microcosm, scaffolding, you, you have those those things will start impacting your 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 position. Thank you very much. Give Gina a round of applause. So we're going to take a 15 minute break. We're, we're going to have a working lunch. Lunch is outside, so please grab your lunch and then come back in here. We will resume in 15 minutes. <coughs>